Hello all you lovely people out there. How is everyone doing? I'm Kate Hill and I am here as always to give you the best content on property along with fantastic strategies, hints and tips. Today, stay tuned for all your latest property news. From next year, some first home buyers in New South Wales will be able to choose between paying the lump sum of stamp duty or an annual land tax. While first homeowners will be the only immediate beneficiaries, the New South Wales Treasurer Matt Keane was not shy about voicing ambition to extend this. Under the plan, first home buyers purchasing a property up to 1.5 million can opt to pay an annual fee of $400 plus 0.3% of the land value. So for example, buying a $1.35 million house with a land value of 810,000, the stamp duty would be 59,125. Under the new scheme, this could cost $400 annual fee plus the 0.3%, which is 2,430, total $2,830. Now, if a buyer is holding on to the property for less than 20 years, say, then they are better off paying the $2,830 per year land tax, which would total 56,600. For apartments, of course, the deal is better because the land value is less. An $830,000 apartment with a $265,000 land value would require an upfront payment of 32,440 stamp duty, or the buyer could pay $1,195 per year land tax. For some, the plan to replace stamp duty with land tax has merit. Being spread out over a longer period of time helps not having to put up as big a deposit, obviously. So why does the state government want to get rid of stamp duty? For most first time buyers, the biggest challenge is getting that initial deposit together. If a first time buyer doesn't need to pay tens of thousands in stamp duty to buy that first home, it allows them to get in a little bit earlier and certainly with a much smaller deposit amount. But it will cost the New South Wales government a lot of money to make changes to stamp duty, which is a key stream of revenue. It accounts for almost one quarter of total revenue of the state government. Just think about that. Moving to a land tax system will take a lot of work. People will need to get used to paying an annual land tax. And for the government coffers, they will need to get used to less revenue. Despite stamp duty being a good revenue raiser, it is not good for much else, according to others. Stamp duty is volatile, it's inefficient, it actually traps people in their homes. People feel that they've made a really significant investment and cost to purchase the property, so they stay in their homes for often longer than is actually appropriate. They think that stamp duty is bad for home ownership, household mobility and jobs. The land tax option will save some first home buyers money, particularly those who do not want to stay in the same house for a long period of time. However, New South Wales Labour say that there are better ways of supporting home buyers, including extending the stamp duty concessions. The New South Wales government has extended the stamp duty exemption for properties under $650,000 and a reduction for homes under $800,000. If you are going to put money on the table for first home buyers, why introduce a brand new land tax system for New South Wales when we've never had one before, rather than just extending the exemptions to allow people to pay no land tax at all, says the opposition leader. Now, according to Domain Chief of Research Nicola Powell, those who may be hit hardest by increasing interest rates don't actually even own property. She says that renters are the ones who may really start to feel the strain. I actually don't think that May is even close. They are feeling the strain. She says that there is already a dire shortage of accommodation with vacancies at rock bottom levels. And if investors try to pass on all or some of the increased cost of their mortgages, it is the renters 
who will struggle. AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver says that with market conditions so tight and vacancy rates so low, tenants may not have too many other alternative properties to move to if their rent does increase. And again, coming from me, I am dealing with this every day. I'm not a working economist. I'm actually out in the property field buying property for clients. That is exactly what is happening. Tenants know that there's a shortage and many literally do not have a choice but to accept that increase because there's nowhere else for them to go. And of course, if they'd been saving up for a deposit, then it's now going to be even harder for them to buy because of their reduced borrowing capacity. Rate City research directors say that tenants in areas where there is already a shortage of rental accommodation may find themselves throwing more money at rents to keep their homes. This is definitely happening out there, people. Interest rate rises may be front and centre for most borrowers at the moment and tenants, as just reported. But the RBA says that most households are well placed to absorb increases despite the higher cost of living. RBA Governor Philip Lowe says that the June increase of 50 basis points to 0.85% will help bring down inflation over time. He says that the RBA data shows households are generally very well ahead of their mortgage repayments with financial stress actually low and declining. According to the RBA, many households increased their savings during the pandemic while interest rates were so, so, so very low. Homeowners with variable rates loans already have a median 21-month buffer on their repayments compared with a 10-month buffer worth at the start of the pandemic. RBA analysis indicates that even if variable rates were to lift by 200 basis points more than 40% of borrowers are already making monthly repayments, which are large enough to cover those increases. It says that many households have ample time to adjust to future hikes. Westpac agrees with the RBA that the vast majority of its customers can cope financially with the interest rate rises. They say that the chances of widespread mortgage stress this year are very low. Customers and businesses were well prepared for rates to lift above what are abnormally low levels. Keep that in mind, everyone. Even at 1.5%, we are still talking about very, very low interest rates. They think that the important thing to recognize is that we have been through a long period of ultra low interest rates. So this is a natural reversion to some degree. Westpac think that future increases will be steady and affordable to most Australians, although they do admit that there may be hardship for some borrowers who are at those marginal levels. Household spending is strong, businesses are generally confident and both consumers and businesses can handle high rates as it was never actually going to remain so low. The building industry is warning of a looming housing shortage as state and local government planning bottlenecks choke the supply of new homes. Analysis by the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation warns that as soon as international migration returns to pre-pandemic levels, there will be an even stronger shortage of properties. It says that the number of households exceeding new supply will rise to about 163,400 homes, very precise, in the next decade. Mervac suggests a federal productivity payment could encourage the states to boost housing supply. Lend-Lease have seen how a carefully managed approach to housing and planning in Singapore, for example, can deliver in months what it takes years to approve in Australia. We should have bipartisan support to a 25-year vision that actually says this is where our corridors are going to grow, they say. Let's get those mapped out quite precisely that both sides of politics support and then facilitate how that gets approved. Now, I will keep you posted as always on all things property from around Australia. As our year progresses, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons if you are enjoying all my free content. And I will see you all again really soon. Bye.